Hello, 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 everybody. My name is Mickey Spear. It is such a blast to have you here. Have you ever met someone who has been in a tragic accident? Have you ever seen a family hurting and were not sure how to help? Have you ever wondered if the power of prayer really works? If so, this show, this episode is absolutely for you. For those of us who haven't met before, welcome. My name is Mickey Spear. I am a musician, talk show host of tonight's show and author of the free grief resource called My Heart Still Remembers. And we've got such a powerful episode for you tonight. But I just wanted to give a little background of the show first before we dive in. So when I was 13, my mom passed away from cancer and I spent the better part of a decade avoiding and not feeling and doing everything I could to not process that. And I realized all these years later how detrimental that really was. So I wanted to start a show to not only learn how do we address our own healing, whether that be grief, disappointment, you know, tragedy strikes, like what we're gonna talk about tonight, as well as how do we help people who are in situations we can't necessarily relate to. I can't count the number of times people have asked me, what do I say? How do I help? I'm not sure where to go. And tonight we have an amazing guest who is going to help us learn more about his story and, and answer some of those great questions regarding accidents. So, on season two, that's the kickoff of tonight's show of Healing Half. I am so honored to be able to welcome on Matt Crow, who, and I will let him tell his amazing testimony here in a second. So I'm not going to spoil anything, but he is in a documentary called Triple Bypass Writing Back to Life. And I will send that link out after the show in my summary email. So if you haven't yet, please head to the website that is in the comment section. Make sure you're on my email list, my community list, as well as get your free copy of My Heart Still Remembers. And that story will be in that email. So you're gonna absolutely want to watch that after hearing him. So without further ado, Matt, welcome. Hi, it's nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm just really excited. So, so thank you. It's an honor. Yes, we are so, so grateful to have you. So the first question that I, I've seen your video, but most people haven't. Do you mind just kind of starting off the show with how, what happened and how did your accident come about? Yeah, so um, I had been an avid road rider, uh, so road cycling, um, pedaling a bike for quite some time. I had mountain biked beforehand uh, for a few years, but I just kept getting bumps and bruises and I decided to stop doing it. And I was training for some rides and some friends asked me to go up to Aspen um, to, to basically go and, and cross train and to mountain bike with them. And, um, and in June of 2018, it was uh, June 23rd, I had a terrible accident where I went over the handlebars. I was trying to avoid an Aspen tree. Uh, and on that day I became a quadriplegic. So, um, uh, I, I basically remember <clears throat> flipping over my bike. I thought I had just put a, you know, kind of landed on a rock and, and hurt mm -hmm. my back. Um, and then when I went to move, nothing moved. So the only oh thing that happened God. is that my hand was in front of my face. I went to get up to do a push up, and my face was sort of halfway in the dirt, just buried in the dirt. And I'm looking at my hand and. Uh, the only thing that happened was my thumb twitched. Nothing else moved. Oh and and I was I was there for 20 minutes before the next rider found me. My all, all my friends who I was with had already they were in front of me. I was sort of the slowest mm -hmm. rider of the bunch. Yeah. And um, they weren't going to be back up to find me for another 40, 45 minutes. So I was alone on that mountainside for 20 minutes, completely paralyzed, not able to do anything. And that was a pretty catastrophic 20 minutes of of uh, of my life. I can only imagine, I, I can't even imagine the the fear that must have been in that moment. How did you remain um, hopeful and calm in that moment? I mean, obviously people found you, which is great, but oh my gosh. I Well, I, I didn't. So, you know, you always ask what's going to happen in, in, in that instance. And for me, and everybody's going to be different, but I, I, for me, what happened was that as soon as I realized what was going on, 
every thought just one would fly in and then it would sit there for a second. Am I, am I going to live? Then it would fly out and another thought would come in. Am I going to be paralyzed the rest of my life? Am I ever getting off this mountain? Will I ever see my wife again? Will I ever see my kids again? And it's just one after the other, after the other. And it, it was almost in a, in such a fast repetition that it was just kind of uncontrolled shock. And that's really what yeah. hit me. Um, you know, about two minutes in, uh, about two minutes in, I realized that I was still breathing and my breathing was shallow. It was very labored. It, it literally was. And I was collapsed on myself sort of in a fetal position. Yeah. So I couldn't I couldn't even get my my lungs to open up to take a, a stronger breath. And, and my breath was really on autopilot. But after two minutes, I realized that at least I was breathing because if I wasn't mm. breathing, I would just sort of fade away. In, into black and that would have been it. And, uh, and it was then that, you know, I realized I'm, I'm, I'm breathing. So there's a good chance I, I might make it out of here. And then I really thought about, well, I can't move anything. I tried to move something. I, I really tried as hard as I can. I, I remember I said, I don't care what's going to happen. I'm going to move no matter what. And unfortunately, uh, it just, all it did was give me the mm. biggest, most searing pain in the middle of my back. And then I said, I will not be doing that again. Yeah. And then I had to listen for other riders. So I'm trying to see if I can hear anything. And that was really interesting because it was beautiful. It was serene. There was birds chirping, mm -hmm. wind was blowing through the trees. And here I am on the side of a mountain at almost five o'clock in the evening, not able to do a thing. And, <sighs> um, and at that point in time, I, I actually said, well, what, what can I control? And it's interesting because the only, it's really the only thing that we have true control of for the most part is our thoughts. And that's all I had control of. Mm. And so I just started doing the math. Look, by the time that somebody's going to get me, it's going to be 40 minutes, uh, you, you know, from a phone call by the time that, you know, probably emergency services, maybe an hour. Um, and so I know I need to be turned over and uh, I, I know that I need help when that next rider arrives. And, uh, and then I just started thinking about those things while still panicking. Um, but it did give me some sense of, okay, like, uh, of just sort of getting, getting a grip. Um, but the problem was I tried to even uh, get enough of a breath for air so I could take a deep breath to yell and it, it couldn't come out oh my God. and it couldn't so come I'm, out. Wow. That's unbelievable. So a I mean, obviously you're here today. So, so somebody must have found you. Um, yeah. So what's the next kind of next step? So they found you. How did you kind of get from there to the hospital? Then? So they found, they found me. My friends came uh, that I was carted down to Aspen Valley Medical Center. They took a CT scan. I'm very good friends with the spine surgeon that I wanted to be the guy that operated on me. My friends called him. He actually came in. Uh, and he operated with another surgeon on me that night. And, um, you know, the, 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 the part that I think really begins to, to take an interesting turn is my wife. You know, I have two kids. And at the time, I think they were four and three. And, mm. uh, you know, she didn't know anything. And yeah. my friends didn't want to panic her. I told them to tell her exactly what was going on, that I'm completely paralyzed. And they didn't do it. And so that was probably a smart thing because she wouldn't have been able to drive. She wouldn't have been able to do anything. Mm. And, um, and then, so she came down to the hospital and she was in for a very rude awakening at that point, seeing, seeing me not able to move. My eyes are completely dilated. Mm. The only thing that's happening is my, my, my hands sort of just twitching and flopping around like that. And all of a sudden she realized the gravity and she tried to go yeah. to her automatic mode, honey, everything's going to be okay. And I, mm. and I've been in the medical field and I, it's crazy, but it's specifically in spine for 10 years, I've been in a thousand spine procedures or if not more, and I knew it was terrible. And I just said, yeah. honey, it, this is not good. And, and the surgeon came in and he said, look, uh, I, I said, don't sugarcoat it. He goes, it's really bad. And I said, well, well, just tell, tell me the way you see it. And he said, it's one of the worst cases I've ever seen. And uh, so maybe, maybe it's sugarcoated a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go but back. Let's go back go to back. sugarcoating but, it. Um, but they operated on, on me right then and there uh, as soon as they did some diagnostic tests and stuff like that. 
And, but my wife, if you put, you know, I've got one situation and then my wife is another situation here. She is walking into a hospital thinking maybe I'd broken some bones, but I know that she knew that I hadn't bled a whole lot and there wasn't a whole lot of bleeding. So she felt kind of okay about that. But then when she gets to the hospital, I can't move. She sees my hands like twitching and she hears the doctor say that this is one of the worst cases I've ever seen. And then the chaplain leads her out to the compassion room and lets her know that I may not make it out of surgery and that that's a real, that's a real option. And so her world collapsed on her and she didn't expect anybody to be there. She said, I'm going to find, you know, to, to, to the hospital, I'm going to see Matt. And this is one of the big things for, I think people to know people started showing up. And, Mm. and some really important people showed up and some people that she didn't know very well showed up. But when she learned that information in the compassion room, she collapsed. Mm. She absolutely collapsed on the floor and went straight to prayer. And I will tell you, there were four other people in the room from, from our friends and family, and then the chaplain themselves. And my, we have two friends that are next door neighbors and they were there with, they're strong Christians, but man, Mm. I'll tell you that the other two that showed up, they are like (laughs) pastoral leaders. And my wife started with a prayer and they jumped in and it was a cry to God. And I'm telling Mm. you, it was a cry to God for healing. And the two, our next door neighbor said that they're not sure what happened that night but they know that they were either watching or were part of a miracle. And they will tell you that to this day that it's still, they don't know. They still don't know how to take that. Yeah. That's unbelievable. And I I know your faith is so, so, so important to you, to your family. Obviously um, we all believe God. We'll talk about that later towards the end of the story, but in that moment, after the surgery, as she's finding out the worst possible news, pretty much you might die. Like you said, it was not guaranteed you were going to make it through the surgery. Right. That the next few weeks of a, an extreme uncertainty, you're seeing your dreams kind of fade away. How did you guys lean on your faith and how did that help you through those times as a family? So. I think sometimes you're not even aware what's happening until much later, especially Mm -hmm. in a crisis mode. What was really interesting for me is that, you know, I I went from being a guy who could put on the helmet, bring down the visor, put on the armor, go out and take on the world. And and I was that guy. I think I I was your sort of average Christian guy, (laughs) you know, go to church on Sundays. yeah, you know, I, I'm, I was baptized recently as a, as a mm-hmm. show of my faith as an adult. I've always been Christian, but really kind of a, 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 a rededication so that the world will know. And um, so I'm not necessarily the poster child for getting baptized because it was very shortly thereafter when this accident happened. And what happened was I went from that guy to literally not being able to feed myself, not being mm-hmm. able to go to the bathroom by myself. And... Uh, and so there was a couple of things that happened, but number one is I immediately, for whatever reason, went into a bubble of the day and tomorrow, like you said, hopes and things. I didn't even think that far ahead. Okay. I just went into a bubble of the day to think about where am I today in the mm. beginning of this day when I wake up and then all I could make was a vision of that day. Mm. And Man, I got to tell you, there was so much, I don't know why this happened to me, but I never, the only time that I ever said, why me? It was never a why me? Why do I deserve this? I had an accident. Things happen. Mm -hmm. Bad things happen. Good things happen. And it's just, that's the way it is. But I was so thankful and grateful for whatever it was that I would get back. And man, Mm -hmm. the people that showed up in spades, the village I cried. There were two things that I would do in the middle of the night and I'd always wake up because they had me on some weird medication and I wake up panicking. 
<laughs> so <laughs> avoid as much medication as you can would be my number one statement. Right. And then, uh, and, and then, but I would work on my hands because to lift my finger, uh, where's the camera here? To lift my finger that much was like living the, lifting the heaviest weight and finding new connections. I literally had to find my entire left arm. They couldn't tell me how to do it. They would set up electrodes, try and, you know, shock it. So where maybe mm -hmm. I could think something and, and feel something, but I couldn't feel anything. And they couldn't tell me how to go all the way down my arm and get this finger to do that. Oh my and I literally God. had to find that out on my own through meditation mm -hmm. and through visualization. That's the yeah. only way I was able to do it. Um, but when I wasn't working on my hands, almost every night I would cry for hours mm -hmm. because so many people showed up and, and I truly believe that that is the love that God represents. Yeah. And I saw it in spades mm -hmm. unleashed in a torrent. I mean, if you look at the way that we go through life on a daily basis, good things happen, bad things happen. And, uh, and you, you just kind of get jaded to certain things. And so you sort of get this, your own lens on how the world is and maybe you skew yeah. your own lenses. Well, after that, I went from, you know, now to not being able to do anything by myself. Mm. And all of a sudden for 60 days, I see nothing but a torrential tidal wave of unconditional, unrestrained mm. love that doesn't stop. And it was like 10,000 candles in the, in the darkest night. It really was. And it, mm. it, and it broke my heart in the best way possible that I could feel. Yeah. That's amazing. And I know um, on this show, we are so interested in how can we help people in situations that we don't understand. I hope most people on the show have not been in your situation or your family's situation. So could you give us just a couple of examples of in the darkest moments, what helped you and your family the most and things that we can kind of take with us. And conversely, was there anything, any comments maybe that were made to you or your wife that you're like, Ooh, not so helpful. No, I, I think people get scared and, and look, every situation is different. Yeah. Um, and and mm. so my situation is different than somebody who has been now diagnosed with stage four cancer, right? Mm. My situation is different than somebody who had a daughter or a son who committed suicide. Yeah. So they're all very different. And, and, I, and so, you know, the other thing is that we live in Denver and we didn't have any immediate family around. And so mm -hmm. to us, this whole experience has changed my definition of family. It mm -hmm. really has. And it's, it's, it's beautiful in who yeah. we now consider to be part of our family. But some of the things um, I think that are really important, I, I really want to start with logistics. Mm -hmm. it, even if you're not somebody who can help with logistics, meal trains. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Taking care of our kids. My wife is, a, is totally falling apart. She said, all I had the capability of doing was, was loving our kids mm -hmm. at night when somebody else would drop them off from school and dealing with that. That's all I had in me. I didn't have anything else in me in that time. Mm. And so meal trains, really kids schedules, yeah. helping out logistically. I had, I had some people who showed up huge, like they need to do this as a occupation <laughs> because I had somebody sleep in my room. They don't allow it in the ICU of the main hospital. And especially with COVID right now, it's not going to happen. But um, at Craig Hospital, which is a world-renowned spinal uh, and brain uh, uh, injury hospital uh, uh, for care, somebody slept in the little rollout cot from either my men's group, from my friends, mm. every single night while I was there. Wow. It's a, I mean, it's amazing the way people showed up logistically yeah. is huge is oh just gosh. huge. So that is the number one thing that I would say mm -hmm. for people is think about what are going to be the core issues that these people are going to be facing and how can we help them logistically? And then, um, and then clearly it's the compassion. And yeah. there's a, there's a couple of things that, uh, that, uh, my wife's best friend, she showed up and 
I don't know why, but from, you know, when it comes around Thanksgiving time, we uh, we're Christian, but she's a, she's a quarter Jewish and we watch uh, uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. Every, like, we always make sure we watch it. She put it on after my accident every night, 10 nights in a row mm. and just needed to have it on. And her best friend sat there and didn't even say a word. She just sat there. Wow. And that it was just being there. Sometimes there aren't the right words and that's right. okay. And that's okay. Just being there for them and letting them know. I think the other thing that my wife, uh, I talked with her specifically about it was um, she would give, be given even texts of encouragement and prayer. Somebody would say, mm. praying for you, boom. And that was a lot. That was a lot for her. Um, and then we had people show up. Somebody showed up with a crazy leprechaun mug that was the size of this <laughs> big. And it was just funny. And another person flew all the way back from Israel with prayer beads that they prayed for me at Jesus. Oh, wow. And then they, that's wow. another story. They collapsed on the floor because they caught some weird bug on the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> had to be wheeled down to the emergency room. So that's a whole nother thing. But that's that's how, for another time. <laughs> that's how people showed up. Yeah. That's how people really showed up. Mm. And I mean, the power of the village, we, I, I've learned a lot of things since that time. I, I think that being put into that piece put me in a bubble of a day. And in that day, I searched for truth because yeah. it really shattered maybe what my view of life, of, of, of what we're all in this for and what matters really shifted really shifted really? significantly and it's shifted even at the tip of the iceberg that just keeps growing. Yeah. And, you know, we're either cutting or weaving fabric in the relationships that we have at any one time. And it's, and it's true to be cognizant of that. I think yeah. there's a lot of different things that I could pour out, but what matters is that, uh, that I mean, whether it's as a man thinketh, think and grow rich, Jesus saying, you know, hold every thought captive. That's at the mm -hmm. end of the day, what we really have. We have those thoughts and what are we going to do with those and how are we going to mm -hmm. relate to others? And, and when we really start thinking about how that's going to matter in our relationships, it will come naturally. And when you're helping out people who are in crisis, mm -hmm. you know, just show up, be there. When anything happens now for us, man, we're on like emergency <laughs> alert and we're, the, we try to be the first people there oh to pray it, God. to pray it and to pay it forward. We mm. really are. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I'm going to have to like go back through that minute, couple clips and write everything you just said down because that was just gold. So thank you. And if there are those of you watching, whether it's live or replay, make sure you're on my list because I'll, I'll send those notes to my summary email. Um, so that's awesome. So I guess the next kind of fun part of the question is you're in this really low time. How did we, you get out of that? How does the story end? So I, I, again, I, I still have a hard time mm -hmm. with, from my accident, you know, let's, let's just take it in a snippet, like try and put it in a, in a really confined piece. So I had a terrible accident. I'm completely paralyzed. Um, and then I, uh, I just, nobody knows what's going to happen. And, um, my trajectory, however, started changing quickly. Um, and so my recovery was, was pretty, you know, when you see the film or if you, if you yeah. never see it, when you take a look and, and if you can get a hold of that CT scan, 100 out of 100 spine surgeons will tell you I'm never moving again. Wow. 100 out of 100. Oh my God. You know, Lonnie says it in the, my, my spine surgeon says he goes 99 or hundred out of hundred are going to say this patient's getting, but I'm telling you it's a hundred because I've yeah. heard it from all of them. <laughs> and, um, and so when you get anything back, it's a huge milestone and hope is what all of this at the end of the day is mm. about. That's really at the end of the day where people are kind of looking for. And no matter what situation is, the lens that you're going to be looking through it, is it a mm. lens of hope 
or is it not? And that does mm. go back to your thoughts. That goes back because the one thing I could never understand, I'm in this bubble of the day. I know where I'm starting. I have a vision of where I'm trying to go that day, which is mm. almost kind of in a way meditation and prayer at the same time. Yeah. And one of the first things that I had to do was not actually pick up the Bible. And I think it was God telling me to do it. Mm. It was to pick up a book that I, I couldn't hold a book. So all I could do is get something on my phone, press play and lay my phone on my chest. Mm. And I listened to Victor, Victor Frankl's book, A Man's Search for Meaning. And if you don't know mm. what that book is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but it no, is, no. he's a Jewish psychologist who had the unfortunate experience of being in Auschwitz. Mm. And he wrote about his ob observations as much as just from a straight third party, non-biased view on why people made it and why they didn't. Wow. And that for some reason was a massive calling in my heart. Mm. And there were some things that I know were God's voice telling me, and that was yeah. one of them. And that's where I had to start because I think at the end of the day, once you start going through tragedy, you want to understand truth and truth in life and truth in, in, in so many things. And yeah. so um, that's where I started. And, and I never thought, you know, now I'm not going to be able to do all these things that mm. really at the end of the day were make more money or, you know, get to the top of my company or, or, or whatever it is. Those weren't the thoughts. It was the thought of this has happened. Here's where I am. Let's move forward in this day. And it wasn't until months later that I really even considered where's the long term going to start to go. So sure. I, I would say that try to try to take this day hostage in, in, mm. in that's the day that you're in. Yeah. Don't consider what's going to be past that. Live in the present. You've got people around you. You've got things that you can accomplish on this day. And, and, you know, whether it's stuff that's happened to us in the past, mm. if you hold on to those things, they imprison you. You actually imprison you. Mm. Don't do it. Don't give those things power. Yeah. Give that. I could worry about so many different things. Why? Why don't give do them that? power. I love that phrasing. Don't give them power. And don't imprison yourself. Don't imprison yourself with anything. Take 100% responsibility from where you are this day to move forward and mm. enrich yourself. Learn things. I had a guy who's been challenged mentally that I, I uh, am sort of a mentor for. And he said, you know, what do you, tell me about your mental work. And I, I, he said, do you spend a lot of time on that? And I said, only when I was training for the triple bypass. And since nobody knows what that is, it's not a heart procedure. I, uh, <laughs> one year from my accident, um, made a huge, uh, huge goal, set up a huge goal. And uh, that's kind of giving the film away <laughs> at the end. <laughs> but that's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Um, to do a 120 mile bike ride. It's one of the hardest bike rides in, in all of the United States. It took me 11 and a half hours to do. I call it, you know, 12 hours of magic. It really was. And it, to train, to get to do that, even the opportunity to get back on a bike. Yeah. I mean, wow. And, and what I found is that things that challenge us the hardest are what really make us better. You know, mm. they really are. It's not that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I mean, there might be a lot of truth in that. But but really now it's, you know, if you think about setting a goal, people are like, I'll set a goal to make, I don't know, $100,000 or a million dollars or whatever. So I'm going to set a goal to do X, Y, and Z. And what I, I, I heard that I loved is whatever those goals are, in, even in that day, is it's not what the goal gives you. It's who that goal makes you become. Mm. Wow. That's amazing. I love it. And, re and really think about it from that perspective. If it's just to do X, Y, Z or to, to, you know, really to experience the, the things that you can bring to the world. We get so caught up. And oh man, I'll tell you if there's one other thing, 
I love things like Facebook. I love things like Caring Bridge, you know, that yeah. somebody set up for us and helped raise money when we needed it. Mm. But those things, all those things take margin. Yeah. And so Facebook will want to take your margin. They have teams of people that want to take your margin so that you can't use your own margin to make yourself better. At the end of the day, we can go to people and uh, and we go to scripture, go to faith, spend time, meditate on it mm. so that we can move. But we need that margin to do it. You need that space away where you're really taking a look at yourself, your situation, who you are and where you want to be. Mm. And you need to you need to hold that captive so that you can can grow. And that only happens by margin. And then by setting the things that, hey, this is who I want to be. This is who my purpose is, making a purpose statement for yourself. Those are all so valuable in really right. each day and each day as it moves forward. Mm. <laughs> oh my gosh, I I know we could talk for about 12 more hours, you know, like you're saying, like just as long as the triple bypass. But um, we unfortunately gotta kind of start wrapping it up. But I want you got to, it. Yeah, but obviously we we've got this great picture on the screen. Do you mind? I know you you touched on it in there. So after a year of this massive journey, you were able to complete it. You're a hundred, would you say you're a hundred percent now at this point? No, 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 and I probably never will be. Okay. Um, and uh, and you know, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, people ask me, w "Would you, if you could go back and change your situation now, would you?" And I actually wouldn't. Yeah. I I wouldn't change it. I I have been so blessed internally and spiritually. Mm. I never would have been able to get to where I am yeah. today without going through that journey. And I oh ask people gosh. to embrace that. I really ask people to embrace their journey, mm. even if it really stinks. Embrace it when it stinks. Mm -hmm. And when you yeah. do that, I believe you cannot claim your greatest strength until you truly claim your greatest weakness. Oh, I love that, Matt. You are such a blessing to me, to my audience, to the show. Thank you so much. I'm going to actually put your verse on the screen and I'm going to share it so everybody can see it. Um, and they'll actually still be able to hear our voices so they can hear you. Um, Romans 5 verses 3 through 5 was one that you purposely kind of said, like, this is one of your favorite verses. Um, this is my own. favorite verse. <laughs> Do you it, mind is, it is my go-to in the film yeah. that is written on the side of our cycling kits because mm. it is one of the only places in all of the Bible that they truly give the blueprint for transformation. And it's right there. Yeah. Um, I don't know. How much time do we have left? We've got like a minute left, a minute or two, but you take uh, as much time as you need. Well, the one thing that I would say is the 101 version of that is we all have suffering and suffering mm. is like a ball and chain. You can try and go on and put your facade in life and to other people and unfortunately, most of all to yourself and you bury your weaknesses, you bury your pain and you don't address it. Perseverance is the first step in saying, I'm going to pick up that heavy ball and not try and drag it around and not show anybody else and put on my facade to the world. It's I'm going to pick it up and it's going to hurt. It's going to, it's in it, some days you're going to drop it right on your foot and you're going to break your toe and you're not going to like it. But over time, that will that is living in perseverance and that is yeah. the goal and then over time that will eventually shift to character and and mm -hmm. and it's character in each different facets in our life and for every person it's different for me to build my character in certain ways versus you it may take me 10 years and it may take you 30 days but it it has to come out true and right. when that finally shift happens habitually on a daily basis that is when hope truly not only starts ringing true within yourself, but more importantly, starts ringing true to others. And we can take our own stones, our own rocks that we've been carrying around, and we can use them to slay the giants of others. Oh, Matt, thank you so much. You are such an inspiration. I mean, to go through what you have been through and to be saying all of those things is so powerful. Praise God for you, for your testimony. Um, I am just so grateful. And I know we're going to be back on the show with you eventually one day. So we're just so glad to start that conversation. So thank you so much for being here tonight. 
Thank you. God bless. Thanks, Matt. And wow, you guys, unbelievable. I, I am just blown away. I'm going to have to rewatch this about 50 times and take all of his nuggets out because he had some extremely wise words of wisdom. So I'm going to go do that, grab my notes, and then I'm going to send both those notes and the documentary that he's talking about in my summary email. So if you aren't on the list yet, be sure to head to mickeyspear.com, grab your free copy of My Heart Still Remembers, and be sure to um, keep your eyes peeled for those emails because we have a lot of really great resources, both free, both motivational, all lots of great stuff in there. So I just wanted to wrap up the show tonight with a song. You might have heard it here before. If not, that's okay. It's called Big Plans. And I was thinking about it and I was like, what song do I have in my little repertoire that kind of fits this message tonight? And I'm thinking about Matt's, you know, where he was at the lowest point and he held on hope. Um, and people came around him and supported him in prayer and in faith. Um, so I wanted to play my song, Big Plans, that I co-wrote with a dear friend of mine out in New York City named Becky Park. Um, so the lyrics of the, the little section I'm going to sing tonight are in the chat feature. I will be releasing it on Spotify, hopefully, um, within the next few months. And now that my um, production course is all done. And so I'm just going to sing it a little bit for you guys. I hope you like it. I hope the message um, does something for you. When I'm lost and broken and my soul is choking and I feel like there's nothing for me, I look to the cross and cry out because you know more than what I see and you remind me. You have big plans for me I'm right where you want me to be Ground me in faith as I walk in your grace and trust in you Ground me in faith as I walk in your grace and trust in you. May that be our prayer tonight, you guys, that we absolutely remember no matter where we are, whether it's on, uh, you know, getting ready for a fun weekend or laying in a hospital bed after a tragic accident, that God does have big plans for you. And Matt shared his amazing story tonight. Um, and that is part of his mission, you know, is to share his story, is to share his testimony. And each and every single one of you have a powerful story, too, that um, is worth sharing. So thank you so much for being here tonight as we kind of go into fall season of the healing half. Make sure you tune in next week for an amazing story we've got about someone whose husband tragically passed away. And we're going to learn a ton of great insights how she also turned tragedy into pain. So thank you all so much for being here. I'll see you next week and have a great night. Bye.